Hi, everyone, and welcome to another edition of the Tale Teller Spotlight. Uh, we are very excited uh, today to have with us Naeem Sanders, who, amongst many other things, and he'll uh, certainly tell you about those, um, is, is an author of uh, several books, including uh, A Sacred Place for Learning, Teaching, Leading, and Culture, as well as The Beautiful Struggles of Teaching. And we're going to talk about um, his work and uh, other topics related to it. So, uh, Naeem, thanks for joining us today. Dr. Conrad, thank you so much for having me, and it's a pleasure and honor to be here. Well, thank you. Um, so, I know a lot about your background, but tell us our tell our audience about your background in K twelve. You've worn a lot of hats and continue to do so. I have. I've been fortunate. Um, I actually started off as an elementary school teacher, where I taught in Columbus uh, City Schools. Um, after that, I then went on and had an, um, a long tenure of about nine years, where I worked in charter schools here in Central Ohio, serving as a teacher, um, assistant principal. Um, I've had the luxury of opening up. Uh, two charter schools, and even served in the capacity of a uh, vice president of school sponsorship for a while. And then after that transition, I went over into the traditional uh, school district where I've served as a principal um, in two uh, local school districts here in Central Ohio. Um, I've been able to work uh, as an education consultant with the Ohio Department of Education as well. And then my passion in K-12 has actually extended uh, to allow me to be able to service and work as an adjunct professor uh, for Notre Dame College um, in Euclid, Euclid, Ohio. And then also most recently serving as a site supervisor where I uh, evaluate student teachers uh, for Grand Canyon University. So I've been blessed to work from elementary all the way through higher education and in education. <laughs> well, and it gives you a perspective because of all of those experiences that you've had. So I want to dive into first your most recent book uh, that you published this year. Um, it's titled, as I mentioned in the intro, a sacred space for learning, teaching, a sacred space for learning, teaching, leading, and culture. Um, you, in the book, you describe schools as quote, sac sacred spaces. Mm -hmm. um, and I was really like caught by that phrase. Um, and I went on to obviously read more, but I would love for you to share with our audience what do you mean by that? What is this? Uh, what, what, what is it about schools that make you think that they're sacred spaces? Well, when I look at the word, what does sacred mean? Um, without any uh, religious uh, connotation, or if you want to add that to it, you can. It's a place that's special and unique, right? Um, a, a place where um, it is held in such a high esteem that people, it's, they're, it's revered and people honor being there. And so when I look at the institution of schools in itself, I don't think there are other, any other institutions in our society where people of different races, ethnicities, um, experiences, backgrounds, social economics come together for a purpose of getting an education um, and in order to receive knowledge. And then also that education for a lot of people, if taken advantage of, becomes a gateway into prosperity and better hopes and better dreams for their future. And parents and guardians hope this for their children. Um, children want to receive it as well. And then so you have this unique conglomerate of personalities, experiences, and people with different values coming together. But the, the purposes of that is, is, is so common and, and so uh, uh, together that it makes a place a, a sacred place. Yeah, that's, that's beautiful. And, and, and just, and even thinking on, you know, just the notion of our most precious asset, our children, that's where, Absolutely. That's where their, their growth is fostered and who they become really takes shape. So that's, I think that really even adds, you know, adds to that. I think it's an apt description. So thank you for that. No um, I, I, I want to turn just a bit to the, your book, The Beautiful Struggle of Teach, uh, Beautiful Struggles of Teaching. Mm -hmm. um, and in it, you brought up this notion of authenticity, yes. um, that teachers need to connect to their authentic selves to thrive in the classroom, mm -hmm. um, that administrators or school professionals and students need to do the same. Um, what does that look like, and why do you think that's so important? And I, I'm an educator at heart, and I always will be, no matter what capacity that I serve. But sometimes it always baffles me how, as educators, we forget that we're human. And, and people outside of education forget that whether it be a teacher, um, an instructional aide, a paraprofessional, or an administrator, they're human beings. And so teaching in itself is, is, is 
what I describe as just simply being a beautiful struggle in the sense that it's authentic. Um, the same thing with, with life. You know, we are all or should be thankful for life, but that doesn't mean that we won't have challenges and struggles that we have to overcome on a, on a daily basis. And so I think that's the beauty in it. And so I wanted to, to take that and add it to teaching to talk about the beautiful aspects of teaching that currently exists. It, it makes such a difference to, to be able to be a positive influence in the lives of your students, but that doesn't come without some struggle in, in, in doing that. And then just to encourage teachers that if they're able to endure their challenges and get through them, they'll begin to see the beauty of the impact that they're able to make in the lives of children. So I know those two words typically are on opposite ends of the spectrum when you talk about something that's beautiful and something that's a struggle. But I do think when you bring them together, it's really a representation of what goes on in education and what teachers and educators experience as they seek to mold the minds of youth. Well, yeah, and it's not a clean, easy process, right? I mean, it's absolutely. Just, it's easy, like life, right? Absolutely, absolutely. And a lot of things I discuss is it comes with sacrifice. There are some days where you experience heartbreak and you do experience disappointment and you experience setbacks. And then there are so many days where you experience the joy and you see the, the, um, the, the labor of your hard work when you're incorporating things into the lives of kids. So you experience both and you have to be in a place where you can take the good with the bad and I'll say, no, you have your good days and your bad days, but most days are in between. And we often remember our struggles the most because it's our struggles who make us who we are, even as educators. So we're able to learn from these experiences and then provide that into onto our, our students as well to help them grow and mature. I like that. I like that perspective because I, I mean, even with my own students, I often say, they always think I'm crazy. I say, I really hope you fail. Yeah, I want to watch Absolutely, you absolutely. Fail, right, because the reality is, just like in anything in life, but especially I think in teaching, um, we re that's really where growth comes from, is, is that struggle. Absolutely. And in, in, in the book, too, I also give a couple personal stories and then also stories from professionals um, that I've had the opportunity of supervising that were awesome people, wonderful people. But that doesn't mean it's to some capacity. Myself, you, anyone who's listening to this has some shortcoming on our journey to fulfill our purpose. Yeah, that's just that's just part, part of the game, right? I mean, absolutely, just, absolutely. Part, yeah. <laughs> so um, going down this path a little more, because I, I love your, the language that you use when you talk about teaching um, and you talk about education in general, just this very um, reverent uh, language where you hold it in such high regard, which I think is so appropriate. And I just, it's just hearing from a thought leader like yourself, it's just refreshing to, because uh, we so often hear about it in mechanical terms, right? Or absolutely. You, right? using language of, of you know war uh you know you think of the nation at risk right they, they right. literally yeah right they use war uh, metaphors so it, it's just a, it's refreshing to hear that and i i'm i'm glad that people get to hear a thought leader like yourself say that so i want to i want to go a little bit further down that path um you had talked about the importance of what um you are you termed sacred teachers being able to implement the divine Absolutely. and blended um, and I was just so taken by that um, when I was when I was reading reading through that chat that part that portion of your book. Um, mm -hmm. Can you explain what you mean by those two terms, the def the divine and the splendid, mm -hmm. and um, what is what does it what does it mean for educators? Yep. And I and I like the and I use the word the divine and the splendid because I really believe that both of them serve a unique purpose. That's that's an asset to to youth and to anyone that you're serving in education. So it's not about one being better than the other but it's about the two working together. And so I do think when you have something that's divine and splendid, um, it, it can manifest into greatness when you're, again, educating children. And so I often say that in education, you sometimes have this unspoken divide where we have accountability, which is not a bad thing at all. You have accountability where students, they have to learn. That's what they go to school for, to learn, to grow, and to master content and obtain knowledge. And so we are in an age of accountability where oftentimes these things are measured in progression through the curriculum and content and then of course mastering assessments as we know um, standardized testing there's a place for that you know um, we do use those those infrastructures and, and, and again they're current and they're a necessity to education then you have the other side where i call the humanistic side of education as well too 
where you may not get to that curriculum, but you've made the difference in the life of a child by listening to them and being an advocate for their emotional and social needs. You have that aspect of it too. You have that time where you do have to put aside maybe the, the standards for a second and have a really um, transparent conversation about life and some of the things that your students are experiencing and, and dealing with in their everyday life. So here you have these two sides, the divine and the splendid. And oftentimes you'll have educators having to feel that they have to be on one side of the fence. So I have to get through this curriculum, get through these standards, make sure students are, ma make sure students are mastering content and then put these other things aside. Although I know my students need that social emotional learning and that caring and that support. And then you have some teachers who I have to meet their social and emotional needs and I'm gonna listen to them all day and hear about their concerns, but I don't necessarily give them the proper tools to prepare them for the next grade level. Mm -hmm. And I'm here to say that you don't have to compromise one for the other. And there's a time and place for splendid learning to occur and then divine trans, trans communication in between the two as well. And so sometimes what we'll get is we force our educators to be on these two sides when in actuality, I really believe in the schoolhouse and in the classroom, there's space for both to coexist without sacrificing one for the other. And I think that's important for uh, a lot of our teachers are extremely familiar with, um, you know, the realities that, that we are really adhering to or, or teaching and fostering these two sort of distinct absolutely yet, um, portions of our kids. But I think a lot of parents don't necessarily always realize that that's you know they a lot of a lot of parents often think that they see the the, the traditional curriculum, yes. um, and they think that that's all the you know that's that's really just where the focus is and that's all that we do. But it's really a lot more than that. Absolutely. Is, is what and, and what you'll find even with, with teaching, a lot of the good work that occurs that goes on is unseen. So those relationship building things that that students need, and that also teachers do on a regular basis, being able to connect with kids, uh, being able to again to listen to them, being able to su provide support for families on how to help their children at home, those are often things that aren't on paper, um, that are done and conducted by wonderful teachers on a daily basis um, that occur in the classroom. And those are critical, right? Especially for our most resistant and struggling learners, um, to make those connections are a means to getting to the content, right? Absolutely. I mean, absolutely. Yeah. And, and I'm a firm believer. I don't, I don't know if, if most students will remember everything that every teacher ever taught them in, when it, in regard to the curriculum. But I do know and do feel myself included that most adults will remember how certain teachers made them feel for better or for worse. And so that's what's captured most in their development as, as they grow into adults. Oh, I love that. That's so true. That those are the things we often hold on to. Absolutely. I think absolutely. anybody that's listening to this interview can probably think back in their educational past and have remember how so, one person, one teacher that really just they connected with. And it, it, it really goes back to that. How do they make them feel? Not so much. Oh, it was just so they did such a great job of teaching me about, you know, cell, you know cellular division. Right? It, was, it was a lot. <laughs> it's very true. And it's interesting because that, I think, transcends on to generations. You know, myself and then you included, I'm sure, you'll share stories with your children about those teachers who made you feel a certain way. So that's, that speaks to the legacy and the strength of the influence that teachers have on their students. It's one of the things that makes the profession so incredible. Absolutely. <laughs> Humbling. Um, so I'm going to go a little bit bigger picture here because mm -hmm. I will... I wanted to for a number of reasons, but you have such, because of all of your experiences, you just have such a unique lens um, and you can see a forest and you could see a, a needle on a pine tree, right? So you've seen and everything in between. So here we go. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to take my magic wand here. Okay. And I'm gonna leave it. And I am going to put you in charge of K-12 education in the United States for an, an undetermined period of time. Okay. Um, what would you do to make schools um, really flourish as sacred places for learning? How do we get there? That's a, that's a good question. I think, me personally, I, I think I would start with helping students, putting a focal point on developing their passions and their strengths. Mm -hmm. I think once, if we begin to do that early, we can cut some of the layers of time 
and we'll have more time, the time that we're looking for when it comes to educating kids. So I do think that if we could focus on helping them discover and, and exposing them to unique opportunities and experiences where they can develop who they are, um, not only as students, but also as people, that will help them grow into the areas in which they want to become. I think sometimes with our kids, we end up shortchanging them by teaching them the basic content, but not necessarily relating that information to how you can apply it to real world experiences that will help students to discover their passions, their love, their talent, and really discover for, for totality their purpose in life. Um, so that would be one thing if I had the magic wand to do. And I think the other one would be definitely to include uh, more wraparound services to help support families who are in need um, and to bridge that gap that sometimes exists between homes and, and, and schools. So definitely making families and the home life an extension of school and making school an extension of the family life um, where students be able to see that one track trajectory as far as, as they grow and, and mature into adulthood, I think would be a wonderful thing as well too. Um, and I think thirdly, I would break down the, the walls, the silos and walls that exist in education and connect teachers in California with teachers in Ohio and teachers in Florida with teachers in Canada. And so you break down those silos and now you have a profession of practitioners who are able to learn from one another regardless of the school district that they're in and not necessarily have to depend on the professional development or the learning tools within the confines of that school district or that state. But looking at it globally in that perspective of two, I think you will help teachers be able to grow and expose them to different things as well. I think sometimes teachers feel so isolated, um, even within the confines of their classroom or their school building or their school district, and even sometimes the state, and not understanding that they are a part of a, a massive fraternity or sorority of brothers and sisters of educators who seek the same goals and have the same values that they have to, to help to help the kids. So those would be the three things I could do if I had the magic wand. <laughs> I'm going to see if I can find the magic wand. There you go, is, right? <laughs> that's on the um, I just love, I just love that your, your, your perspective is just so valuable. Um, so I, I hope that a lot of people hear this interview because um, I'm with you. I, I'll, can you hire me? <laughs> Absolutely, you're hired. <laughs> Undersecretary of Ed. <laughs> we'll go with it. We'll it's go with it. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, totally outside of Ed, you are a busy person. You are you, and you wear a lot of hats, as we've mentioned. You're an author. You're a principal. You're a mentor. You're a supervisor. You are so many things. Um, but when you get away from all that, and you can turn your try to you know not think about all the things education, which I know is really hard to do. And a lot of educators can relate to that, right? Because we just live it, think it, breathe it. Um, you're in your car and you're on your way to work. What are you thinking about? What do you think about just a non-education related? What kinds of things that's, you think about? That's interesting. I, I think uh, as simplistic as it may sound, I'm a big uh, uh, fan of sports. So oftentimes I may reflect, especially this time of year on the game, where we have a season, I hope we finish the season. I hope the Bengals do better. Um, so <laughs> I'm, I'm a huge fan of sports and oftentimes think of that. Um, I'm a big, I love to travel. So oftentimes mm -hmm. think in terms of, you know, what places I would like to go, people I would like to meet, things I would like to see um, in that respective as well. And aside from, of course, if I'm not driving, I am a book junkie. I love to read. Um, and so I have an extensive library and love to just indulge um, in, a, in a quiet space and, and really one way to clear my mind is to to engage in, in, in reading. That's terrific. Um, Naeem, thank you so much for taking the time to, talk, to speak with us today. Um, we wish you all the best as you're moving forward and hope to keep collaborating with you in the future. Absolutely. Thank you so much for your time. And I greatly appreciate it. You have a good day. Thank you.